Energy Media readers, we've got a very, very interesting Zafi for you today. Uh, we're going to be talking to Julie Roll, who uh, is a geologist uh, based in Alberta. And she and a colleague founded Regenerate Alberta uh, in 2017. And the purpose of Regenerate Alberta is to get the industry thinking about using abandoned assets for other purposes. So uh, one example might be taking an abandoned well and turning it into uh, geothermal. Or you might do something else with uh, pipelines or facilities, whatever they might be. But these are assets that the industry has long considered to be a liability. They need to spend money on it to uh, reclaim it or dispose of it. And uh, Julie and her, and her uh, group were talking to the industry and, and uh, you know, the uh, Albertans in general about uh, repurposing these and uh, part of the circular economy. We'll get her to explain what that means. So Julie, I'd like to welcome you to, uh, to our Zafi today. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. So why don't we start with uh, just a brief overview of how you got started and what it is that Regenerate Alberta did or does. Maybe. Yeah, sure, for sure. So Regenerate, as you said, was founded in uh, 2016, actually, um, to, uh, to try and find a way to take advantage of uh, what everyone was considering to be a massive downturn. Um, I don't know if we can think that far back to 2016, but there was um, round after round after round of layoffs in the oil and gas industry. And um, I happened to be working in the space of helping out with doing those. And so I was very front and center with the people aspect and the impacts of that. And so it got me thinking about, um, you know, all these people, what are they going to do? Um, there's so many great people from this industry, so many um, well-educated and well-trained people, what are they going to do? And so I sat down and started thinking about it. And I thought, it's not just the people that are going to be left behind. It's going to be all of all of the other things that the industry has created, not just the, the people in their careers, but all of the stuff. And um, I, was, uh, I was watching the movie, The Big Short, and uh, I saw how those guys were taking advantage of the mortgage crisis. Um, and it made me wonder, is there a way that we could actually turn this around and see what's, what's being seen as a bad thing and turn it around into an opportunity? And so, I sat down with a couple of colleagues um, over a bottle of wine and we just said, what could we do? And um, Regenerate was born by the idea of combining the people who had the skills, the talents, the desires, and the, the passion for Alberta and the passion for this industry um, and putting them to work to, to find new uses and, and new ways to make money and generate revenue. And, uh, and the other piece of it that I noticed was healthy companies um, support he healthy communities. And so um, I wondered if there's a way to help support the companies that were having a hard time in the downturn uh, so that they could employ more people, pay their taxes, um, give to charity, all the great things that, that companies can do when they're healthy. So, um, so that was the idea. We narrowly focused in on repurposing oil and gas infrastructure fairly quickly. And um, that's where we, we started to pursue ideas. That, that's, uh, that's fascinating. I think it's a, a terrific idea. Can you give us, uh, I, I mentioned geothermal wells, uh, how would uh, Regenerate Alberta work with industry to transform wells that were appropriate uh, into geothermal, for example, if you can give us a you know, little, little anecdote. Sure, yeah. So the intention behind Regenerate was never to be the, the um, executor of projects. It was meant to be the connector of ideas people, technology, um, and opportunities. And so the idea was to, for us to find the people who are having uh, success in developing the technology to repurpose geothermal and to connect them with operators who um, either had no use for that well site anymore or were also interested in pursuing geothermal as an economic opportunity. So a bit of a bridge builder. So walk us through how this might work. Uh, there's an abandoned well near a little town, or, you know, say Hannah or some town like that, and it's been abandoned and it is deemed to be acceptable for development as for geothermal. What happens then? Is there is the, the company that owns the well, do they do the development? Is there another company brought in that actually specializes in geothermal? How does that work? 
Sure. Yep. So um, I'm going to reframe your example just because Penn is probably not a great area. <laughs> my, ge my geology brain is having trouble with that. Rocky Mountain House, Hinton, those are kind of the good geothermal areas. Um, but essentially your question, uh, to answer your question, um, the way that it would work at the moment is um, the geothermal company would need to work with the operator that owns the well and owns the infrastructure. And then an arrangement would need to be made between those two entities to determine you know, who owns and operates and who holds the liability for the site. At this point, um, that's a complicated legal process. Um, and so that's actually one of the big barriers to um, new developments on old infrastructure. Um, but geothermal is a good example of where the original well bore would be used to um, do flow testing and um, check on the flow rates and the temperatures and all of that. Um, but if it was deemed to be a, a good use, uh, a good place to develop geothermal, they'd actually drill a brand new well bore to do that. The existing oil and gas wells are too narrow to produce um, geothermal at, um, uh, at commercial levels. And so, but what would be used is the pad site and the roads and the, all of the other infrastructure that's in place, potentially the power lines. So um, that's a- Right, gotcha. Kind of a and of that. It, it, I hear a lot of chatter about the potential for geothermal in, uh, in Alberta. Uh, is there potential to do it economically? Can it produce power and heat and whatever else that, you know, it, it, so that it, it's competitive? Sure. So the big thing with geothermal, again, is the offtake. And so you have to either be near the place where you're going to sell the power or um, near a place that's going to use the heat. From my understanding of the geothermal aquifers um, within Alberta is that they're typically not super hot, not like the ones you get in northern BC. And so a lot of the use cases for geothermal are often heat related. So places that would need industrial heat um, rather than electricity. Um, so I think that's most of the commercial opportunities in, in Alberta are available for that. Although there is some, there are some companies working on power development as well. Well, let's talk about some of the other infrastructure that could be repurposed. Can you give us an example or two of, of that? Sure. Um, so a lot of the wells in Alberta that are still left unreclaimed are old wells. Um, the newer wells, uh, once they're done, they're, they're typically easy to be reclaimed and, and they're a lot cheaper, so they get reclaimed often quicker. And so um, a lot of these old wells were drilled under different regulations and the contamination on site can be quite um, extreme, you know, upwards of $500,000 to remediate a site and clean up all of the, the dirt. And so um, that's obviously very cost prohibitive for a lot of operators who don't have two pennies to rub together right now. So one of the ideas would be to take one of those sites and um, do some analysis and make sure that the contaminants weren't going to harm uh, anything or anyone. And then to redevelop for solar on top of that. Um, so to make sure that it's safe from an environmental and health perspective, but then you could actually use that site for solar um, and generate revenue from it. So that's uh, a potential example of where redevelopment would make sense. Um, where it wouldn't make sense is probably on um, agricultural land where it can be easily reclaimed um, back into a farmer's field. So. so is the advantage in the case of the solar example uh, not so much the, the fact that there's a, a well there, but the fact that there's all the other infrastructure like uh, power connection and roads, that, that's the cost that, that gets saved? Yeah, you bet. Yeah, it's not so much the wellbore. Actually, in most redevelopment opportunities, it's actually not the wellbore that creates the value for redevelopment. It's all the other infrastructure. In some cases, the wellbore provides geological data. Um, so for lithium, for example, um, and for geothermal, it provides geological data and then potential well tests. Um, but often that well bore isn't going to be reused, just the site itself. Right. I'm really excited about the petrolithium idea because I had a chance to interview uh, uh, one of the uh, executives from E3, an Alberta company that's uh, setting up to extract lithium from, uh, from produced water. And, uh, I, and I've also in, uh, uh, interviewed another company that is developing a nanotube membrane 
uh, for other applications other than uh, than uh, produce water. And it sounds like it, there's a lot of potential. Um, so what, uh, in a case like this, is it the advantage for, for the lithium extraction? Does that come out of, the, do they use the same well bore? Or are we, are we is, again, is it a case of the other infrastructure is what enables it to be economic? Sure, yeah. It's, it's similar to geothermal in that they'd use the existing well bore for a test. Um, and in a lot of cases, um, the formations they're producing from, the, those wells were only drilled to the top of those formations. And so they have to deepen the well to get to the water part of those formations. So they would often go in and um, deepen the well bore and then do a production test to see what kind of flow rates they would get for six months or so. And then if they found it to be um, productive, then they would drill a new well for that. So uh, this will be the final question on the uh, Regenerate Alberta, but what, what's industry's response to this being? Uh, it's a, industry is a funny beast in Alberta, I find that it can be, it, as I said in a column the other day, it, it's incredibly innovative inside the box. You make a, engineers and geologists and geophysicists really nervous when you get outside the box and you give them a stroke when you ask, when you ask them to change boxes. Yeah. So where in that spectrum does industry fit? Does anybody have any strokes? I hope not. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, <clears throat> good question. Oh, gosh. And also, like, painting industry with a broad brush is also very uh, hard to do but da and, da and potentially dangerous. But um, it's been a fascinating journey to watch industry evolve on this topic since 2016. So... In 2016, when we first started talking about it, I thought, I, I can't be the only person with this idea. Somebody else must be working on this. I'll just go work for that company. And it turned out, no, no one was working on it or talking about it at all. And so that's why we founded Regenerate. Um, and so we started talking about it and started working on it. And over the years, we got a lot of, hmm, interesting. I don't know why we'd need to do that. Um, that doesn't seem profitable. It doesn't seem prudent, it doesn't seem, you know, it seems like a waste of time and it's not worth the paperwork um, it would take us to do that. And slowly over time, <clears throat> it's been picking up interest. And of course, with um, the Redwater uh, case uh, last year, um, it's picked up a little bit more interest. Um, but all of a sudden, um, it has ignited on into this giant bonfire of opportunity. Um, which has been matched with a billion dollars from the federal government, right? Um, to look into this problem. And so the problem of inactive orphan abandoned um, wells was not being talked about at all. And now all of a sudden it's a huge topic and everybody's interested in it. Um, and so what I'm seeing now is a real shift to listen closer. Um, people were interested, but only superficially before. And now people are asking the next question and the next question and the next question. And we're having a lot more uh, conversations with people to actually collaborate and actually build a project. Whereas before it was like, well, that sounds kind of nice. And um, maybe we'll do it someday just as a, you know, as a good measure. But um, the interest has definitely escalated in the last month, I would say. See this uh, for me, um, uh, Julie, this is a, an illustration of why uh, I write and talk about energy narratives so much is because uh, we talk about energy, especially in the oil and gas industry, in a particular way. And uh, as a result, uh, we're locked into, you know, different ideas of what's possible, what's not possible, how we should respond to, you know, risk and opportunity. And if you change the conversation, uh, even if, you know, the threat or the opportunity doesn't get seized right away or mitigated right away, you still, now you've changed people's perception of the risk or opportunity. And, and narrative to me, uh, I know you get into this debate all the time within the industry. They say, no, 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 no. We don't need narratives and visions and all that, you know, touchy feely stuff. We need plans. My God, give me a plan. It's the engineer in, in the industry talking, right? It's their inner, it's their inner soul. That's when you know when you've really tapped into their inner soul. And, but in, I argue in my columns that in fact, it's exactly the opposite. You need the visions and the narratives first, and then that gives you a view of what's, what's possible. And what's, when you know what's possible, you can make plans and go make it happen. So I'm really, uh, I'm fascinated by this as kind of a case study 
down on the ground of, you know, you started talking about it. Now, four years later, you know, stuff is really happening. People are changing their, their minds. So that, that's terrific. Uh, let's talk about the Energy Futures Lab now. Uh, and full disclosure, folks, uh, from December, January, and February, Energy Futures Lab uh, free, contracted the Energy Media to do some freelance video production and help them a little bit with their strategy on the, the recently launched My Energy Future campaign. So I, you know, just full disclosure. So uh, Julie, now you've recently moved uh, over to Energy Futures Lab. So why don't you give us a little overview of what EFL does and your role there uh, now and congratulations by the way. Thank you, yes. Um, Energy Futures Lab, it's a wonderful place. If you don't know about us, please check us out. Um, we uh, are a social innovation lab um, that's aiming to depolarize the conversation on energy narratives, as, as are you as well, um, as well as trying to build the energy system the future requires of us. And so we're a group of um, 60 to 70 um, stakeholders from across the innovation and energy system from all the way from big oil to innovators um, and entrepreneurs to academics and teachers and community members. Um, uh, we've got indigenous people, we've got uh, students. Um, we try to be as diverse and cover as uh, broad uh, spectrum as we can. And we also recognize the value of narratives and connecting um, technological solutions with people uh, and their heads, hearts, and minds. And so we've, we've also got some artists uh, in the Energy Futures Lab as well. And so the idea is to work across sectors, work across boundaries to try and figure out what it's going to take to build the energy system of the future. Um, and one of our core foundations is leveraging the energy system of the present. And so recognizing that what Alberta has is a strength in the energy system. Uh, how can we turn that into um, a strength in a future energy system? So I've been a Energy Futures Lab fellow since 2017 when I joined with Regenerate. And um, now I'm lucky enough to do this as my full-time job, which just thrills me. I've joined the team in February and uh, it's, it's just the best, um, it's the best opportunity uh, to work on this stuff in this space every day. I want to make a point here, uh, Julie, because you mentioned that, that you know, uh, energy media is about depolarizing the industry or the, the energy narratives as well. But we take a very different uh, approach between energy media and EFL. And uh, what, we've, what we do at energy media, we, you know, we, we see the world as uh, the energy world, particularly in Canada, as being in two camps, which is the drill baby drill crowd and then the leave it in the ground crowd. And so the, they make up 15 or 20% of the Canadian population in each camp. And then the 60 or 70% of Canadians are sitting in the middle, you know, looking for something pragmatic and moderate. And how do we fix this problem? We want the energy transition. We want to respond to climate change. How do we do that? I mean, you know, stop talking, you know, stop yelling talking points at me. And how do we, you know, have this conversation? And so what energy media has done is we've, we've picked the third camp. We're trying to define the third camp and, de and develop narratives around it. And so the energy declaration, which I'd encourage everybody to read, it's on our website. You know, it, it, talk, it talks about the moderate, pragmatic, middle of the road. We, we've got this oil and gas sector. We've got, you know, the emerging clean energy economy. How do we make the pivot? How do we transition in there? And I, I tend to spend a lot of time fighting with the, the other two camps, which is not <laughs> what EFL does. EFL is very much about about building bridges between, you know, various industries and groups and organizations and sectors of the economy. So we take different, even though our, our values and our view, worldviews are very much aligned, we have very different strategies. And is that kind of the way I've described it, Julie? Is that, is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say, you know, we're similar in that we're trying to build out that middle group. Um, and show that, I mean, the early days of Energy Futures Lab was to just show that there is a middle option um, and that a lot of people actually can live in that, we call it the radical middle, because um, it's radical to be <laughs> somewhere in the middle and not at one end of the extreme. So um, to build out that and then also to build bridges um, and what we call and solutions. So not either or solutions, but the and solutions. So how could we have this and that? Um, and so trying to bring together the right people 
from across those different, um, you know, positions, I guess you could say, uh, and find the solutions that can work uh, across, across all of those. Yeah, and I think the EFL membership is really interesting because it's, it really runs the gamut. It's got, you know, uh, as part of the contract that we did on the My Energy Future campaign, uh, we went attended a, a narrative workshop with EFL fellows and, you know, there was the Suncor was there and there was, you know, a, the a representative from the blood tribe down near Lethbridge and there were, you know, a couple of artists and there was this really wide diverse group of, of opinions around the table. And it led, I, I thought it was, it was tremendous uh, in terms of the conversations that it sparked and insights from, from groups that normally whose voices aren't heard. And then they were heard by some of the, you know, the big players like the, you know, the, the oil and gas players who are sitting around the table. So it really is, a, I'm really glad to see that EFL is expanding. I think it's a, a tremendous opportunity. Let's talk about a couple of the initiatives or the approaches of EFL. Like for instance, the bitumen beyond combustion, that's something that, that you folks have been working on. The hydrogen economy, that's another big one that I think has got a tremendous amount of opportunity. Maybe just, Tell us what's going on with those two, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I'm less connected with bitumen beyond combustion, but the idea there is essentially that um, there will be a market for uh, oil and gas beyond when we're burning it. Um, and that even though the, de, you know, the, the climate change um, imperative is, is going to likely reduce the amount that we're burning, there's going to be a market uh, for products. And so, the idea there is to try and figure out ways to um, find new markets for Alberta's bitumen that are not about burning it. And so what, um, what kind of industries are those? Is it carbon fiber? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And how do we connect Alberta's bitumen producers with those markets? So that's kind of the high level there. Um, that's about all I know about that project. Um, but hydrogen um, hydrogen's an, a really interesting one as well because this, is, uh, this isn't so much an initiative as a new industry, right? So I think our initiative uh, is called Building a Hydrogen Economy um, because all of the aspects of this system need to be um, connected uh, in ways that help each other flourish. So for example, if we produce lots of hydrogen, we need to make sure we have places to use it and customers to sell it to and ways to get it to them. Um, and so when one part of the system takes off, the other parts need to be ready to catch up. And so there's, a, there's currently a pilot underway um, between CESAR and uh, the energy, uh, what, are they, what are they called, Maggie? The energy, uh, tra the transition accelerator. Oh yes, David Lazell at the, the Transition Accelerator, Delta. thank you. Yeah, that's one, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks Maggie. Um, for uh, heavy haul uh, trucking. And so uh, one of the great uses of hydrogen has been found to be for heavy haul freight. And so there's a pilot to um, get trucks on the road between Calgary and Edmonton um, uh, powered by hydrogen and uh, to, to start out that, that part of the market and the economy. See, I, I think this is just a wonderful thing because it's not a question of diversifying the economy. It's a question uh, because that, that, you know, that's very set 1970s thinking. It, it really is a question of recognizing that the global energy system is changing. The approach to hydrocarbons is changing. The market for hydrocarbons is, is changing. And you know, oil has a competitor now, electricity, that it's never, never had in 150 years, it has one now. And so Alberta needs to change its thinking about how to maximize those hydrocarbons. And so we both achieve, we're still prosperous, we still have lots of good jobs, we reduce our emissions because we're good, we're good global citizens and because the federal government tells us we have to, you know, and all of those things. And, and we can be more prosperous in 2030 and 2040 and 2050 than we are now because we're using, making better use of the resources that we have. I, this is just, but we don't talk about this enough. And, and it's part of what the energy media is doing is to raise the awareness of those narratives, right? So they're talking about these ideas, how we think, and talk about energy. And Energy Futures Lab, uh, you guys are doing a terrific job. And I should point out, uh, Maggie uh, chimed in for a moment. Maggie Hanna is also a geologist, God bless her, and uh, an EFL uh, fellow as well. So we look forward to a little uh, 
some comments from Maggie. I know she, I know she'll have some comments and questions. So look, let, we're now at uh, nine, uh, 1030 in Mountain Time. So let's open this up to, to Q&A. So if you do have a question, please uh, pop up your little blue hand and uh, I will call on you and then you can, ah, I knew Ross would be right at the top of the list. So Ross, uh, if you could unmute your, your mic and ask a question, please. Uh, yeah, I'm back to the geothermal thing, of course. Uh, now you'd referred to some of the issues around geothermal. Uh, one, of course, is that for Rankine cycle gas turbine generation, you want about 300 degrees, but formation bottoms of the formations are not that hot, probably above 100. Uh, so you've got a so you've got issues in that way. And the other thing that I, I remember, of course, from talking to the engineers, is the problems of dealing with scale in wells and the expense of dealing with scale. Has any of the models you've got or the ideas you've got for like a, some sort of prototype or pilot got beyond the looking at a potential downsides of this? Sure. Um, so I have a bit of knowledge of geothermal, but what I'm probably going to do is just refer to other companies that are doing interesting things in this space. So. Um, Terrapin Geothermics, they're a company within the EFL. Um, Sean Collins is the Energy Futures Lab fellow. They've, they've got a piece of technology that can create power from lower um, temperature um, geothermal. And so they're able to run, uh, I don't know exactly what it is, but under 300 degrees Celsius for sure, um, and probably just over 100 and create power from that. So there's new technologies that are emerging for that perspective. And then with respect to the scale, um, I know Ever, for example, EAVOR, they have a technology called the Everloop. And what they're doing is they're, they're cycling, it's a closed loop system, so they're not actually going into formation water. They're not producing formation water. They're cycling their own fluids through the system. So they go down into a well bore and they connect to another one and come, come up. I'm probably butchering their technology <laughs> description, but... Um, uh, and so they don't actually ever produce any of the, the actual formation water. So I think they've managed to overcome that from that perspective. That's very interesting. I'm sure only, you know, three people in the Safi actually understood that explanation. But the, my, here's my takeaway from it, Julie. Uh, Alberta has, uh, and, I, and everybody, most people on here anyway, know that I spent five years in the industry working for a innovative technology company in Calgary. It was in the Foothills Industrial Park. And so that was my hiatus from, from uh, journalism and communications. And, and, and the thing I learned from that experience is how much innovation, how much new technology, and how many companies there are in Alberta that are doing this. And, and so part of our narrative is that that technology has to be should be expanded into other markets, repurposed for other industries. I mean, this is an opp opportunity for the Alberta economy and for the industry itself that has, I think, been sadly neglected over the, over the decades and needs to be put front and center because Alberta is a technology powerhouse and it just doesn't get the recognition that it deserves as this conversation is, is illustrating. So Dave Juice, uh, why don't you uh, unmute your mic and sure. ask a question, please. Not so much a question as more a comment. I don't know if anyone of you guys follow Catherine Wilkinson with Drawdown, drawdown.org. Anyways, find her on Twitter. She made a, I think this is, I live in Manitoba and I think this is one of the neatest things I've ever heard. She said, what we need is an ecosystem of solutions, not a single species. And this is really exciting for Alberta, stuff like this. Um, yeah, just, just to comment more than anything, we're, Alberta's looking at an ecosystem of solutions, not a single species. And I will leave my mic. There it is. <laughs> Julie. Yeah, we love that. We, I love that analogy. Sometimes we say um, there's no silver bullet, it's a silver buckshot. Um, but I love the ecosystem analogy there. That's, that's beautiful. Um, because you're right, there's no, there's no single solution that's going to solve um, any of these problems. Um, so yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, I, I want to chime in here with a comment because uh, the other thing that, uh, and this is related to the technology, that doesn't get enough play, and part of it is because industry does a really, really bad job of telling its own story. 
but the, the innovation ecosystems, the support ecosystem in Alberta is really remarkable. I mean, there are all sorts of little labs and, and uh, organizations, uh, you know, COSIA, the Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Alliance would be just one example. And these things, you know, these organizations uh, beaver away in the background and do r remarkable work. Uh, Alberta Innovates is another one, Emissions Reduction Alberta, uh, Petroleum Technology Alliance. I mean, they're just on and on. And then you get into the universities, and, and that eco innovation ecosystem, again, doesn't get the recognition it deserves, nor does the federal government, I might add, their contribution to funding it. There's a, hundreds of millions of dollars that goes into this from the Canadian government, never gets any publicity. I argue in, in one of my columns recently that as the federal government thinks about the way to support Alberta uh, and the industry through the pandemic downturn, it should put more and more money into that ecosystem. That is not uh, an expenditure, that is an investment, and it will pay dividends two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road that will do the Alberta economy and the Canadian economy a good stead. So let's go to Edward Hale. Uh, Edward, if you could unmute your mic, please, and ask your question. Hi, thanks, Julie. Thanks, Markham. Um, so first of all, I was just kind of curious about the cost. Uh, how does like a geothermal plant cost compared to like a commercial natural gas plant. Um, and then another question is, I've been also hearing about people applying like machine learning to make uh, like uh, abandoned wells more like economical again. I'm just curious if you had any thoughts or if you knew about that or anything you could share in that regard. Uh, and then thirdly, I've been hearing a lot about direct air capture of CO2. It's like it's a new technology that I thought I'd just bring up. Uh, thought it has a lot of potential, so just looking for information. Yeah, Sounds thank good. you. Thanks, Edward. Uh, Julie, uh, take a crack at any one or more of those <laughs> sure. questions. Uh, my answer will be shorter than you're hoping. Uh, I have no idea about the geothermal uh, question about the power plant uh, versus uh, natural gas, so sorry, I don't have that info. Um, the second question, uh, the third question was on AI. Right. Uh, yeah, was on AI. yeah, I'll answer the AI question. So just about applying. Uh, yeah, applying machine machine learning. Right. So um, the Energy Futures Lab actually has a stream of work called Energy.ai, where we're looking into different applications for um, for AI and machine learning within the within the energy system. Um, what I'm going to do is give our event next week a plug because we're going to be talking about that um, on Friday. So come to that and have a listen and they, the experts on AI can tell you more about that. Um, yeah, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of the orphan wells. I, I, actually, uh, I actually have an anecdote for that, uh, folks. Okay. Uh, <laughs> when I was writing, when I was writing my, my book last year, the, uh, the New Alberta Advantage po uh, Technology Policy in the Future of the Oil Sands, uh, Husky Energy uh, allowed me to interview their director of their innovation group, Jason Hinchliffe. And one of the things we talked about was uh, AI and machine learning as a way to automate all of the, the uh, as to automate the workflow in the corporate head office and, and in their you know regional offices. So basically, every corporate employee, uh, every head office employee, uh, white collar employee, uh, is being taught how to use AI. Uh, software so that they can then automate their workflow and if they stepped out of it uh, it would continue the let the basically formalizes their uh, their experience their information skills and so on and I'm doing a bad job of explaining this because it's kind of complex and I'm not sure I'm the best person to explain but my point here is that the oil and gas companies are adopting digital technologies like AI, machine learning, automation, quantum computing, all of that in a big way. I started reporting on this in 2017, and we're really seeing it accelerate now, in part thanks to the, the Kenny government's corporate tax cut, which gave them the extra money they needed to introduce more job cutting technology. Just as an aside, you can read about it in one of my columns. But anyway, the point here is that this is a big, big trend in the in the industry and it'll be increasing labor productivity in a big way uh, is now and will be doing it over the next five years. So uh, Julie, any comments on the uh, recovery of CO2 from the atmosphere, that technology? 
Um, not specifically. We do have a CCUS carbon capture utilization and storage work stream um, within the Energy Futures Lab. And so I know that um, what we're doing right now is bringing together all the different players within the system um, to explore all the opportunities. Um, and so I don't know much about that technology myself, but I do recall it, it coming up uh, at one of our previous sessions. I'll, again, I'll just jump in here. Carbon Engineering out of Calgary has a plant, a, a, a demonstration plant in Squamish, uh, where they're, you know, sucking carbon out of the atmosphere. And, and uh, so that, I don't know much more about it than that, but you can probably Google it and get some background information. And uh, we should have Richard Adamson, who's an energy media reader and works in the carbon capture and sequestration space, because he was on Azafi, an early one, and was talking about how you know, SAS Power and their boundary plant, they initially the costs were $115 a ton because, you know, it was a one-off and, but now they've got it down to $40 a ton and costs are still dropping. And he thinks that, you know, they're going to get it down to 20 or 30 soon and it will really, uh, CCS will become uh, economic in a way we haven't been talking about. So just as i I'll throw that out there and you can probably find Richard on, well, I know you can find him on LinkedIn, Richard Adamson out of Calgary. Um, okay, we got we'll get time for one more question. So, uh, Doug Hart, if you Thank could unmute your mic microphone, please. Um, thank you. Uh, I'll ask my question, and and it is, why in Canada are we so reluctant to consider alternative energy sources? And then I'll say briefly why the question I think is important. There are 800 geothermal electrical generators in the world in 30 countries. Uh, there have been huge advances made in directional drilling, uh, closed loop uh, systems, uh, heat exchangers, and the use of secondary fluids, and yet we have none in, in Canada, no electrical generators. Uh, I think the federal government invested $25 million in a, um, a pilot near Valmont, but we seem reluctant to drill for heat for heat. We only want to drill for oil for heat, and I wonder why. Julie? My, my guess would be just cost. Um, we're, we're able to produce uh, oil and gas very economically, or we have been until up until very recently. Um, and it's really cheap for us to use it, and it's really readily available. So, um, and then in other parts of Canada, hydropower is also, um, you know, a no carbon emitting source of electricity. So, I think the barriers for Canada um, are both cost um, and and also, you know, there's a bit of a disconnect on the real need to go to low carbon uh, energy sources. Um, and I don't know what the number is today, but a number of years ago, I heard that uh, Canada's electricity is 80% non-emitting uh, on the whole for all of Canada. That's not certainly true for Alberta, but um, because we have so much hydropower, um, we're actually, we actually generate a considerable amount of clean electricity. So those would be my guesses. Um, actually, those are, the, the, your numbers are accurate, uh, Julie. We have 60% of Canada's electricity is produced by hydro. Uh, another 17 to 20% comes from low emitting sources like nuclear. And that you were scheduled to get rid of coal in Alberta and Nova Scotia and, uh, and Saskatchewan by, uh, by uh, 2030. So, uh, that and and the, the hydro of course is, is very cheap you might let's inject some more data in here uh, I would encourage everyone if you're really interested in this in this issue is to go to the lazard.com l-a-z-a-r-d uh, dot com and they have a levelized cost of energy study that they update once or twice a year and it covers all of you now it's American but it's widely used in Canada as well and they cover all of the the costs of the various types of, of electricity, so you can see comparisons uh, between you know all of the natural gas, coal, geothermal, different types of uh, solar, all of these at and wind at at scale. And solar, uh, sorry, wind now is down at, at the bottom end of the range at twenty eight dollars a megawatt hour. Uh, wind, uh, solar is thirty two dollars a megawatt hour. Gas is forty four dollars and new coal is $66, and geothermal is way up over $100 a megawatt hour. 
So my guess here is that there are very specific applications where you, where you can get the heat economically or you can get the electricity economically, but on the whole, those kinds of cost, that cost structure is probably what's prohibiting uh, you know, North America from doing more geothermal. That's just based on what I've seen, Doug, you, I'm sure it's more complex than that, but there we go. That's my contribution to the, uh, to the conversation. Well, folks, thank you very much for this. Uh, I know, Ross, you've got another question, but I promised uh, Julie I'd have her out of here in 45 minutes, and, and we've come to the, top, to the end of our, our Zafi. Julie, thank you very much. This has been a, a very interesting conversation. We wish you all the best at EFL, and no doubt I'll, I'll see you at an EFL event soon. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Great meeting all of you. And thanks, folks, for coming out today, and the recording will be on the YouTube channel. Uh, later on today, I'll post it on our social media accounts. And if you could share it with your networks, I'd be really appreciative.